church. Welcome guys online and it's just great to see you here. I pray that you'll enjoy our service, to enter in, worship the Lord, we have communion around the Word. Pastor Russell's with us, great speaker, guest with us today, so looking, looking good, eh? It'll be a great morning and wonderful. Hey, you're going to welcome someone, but before we do, just turn around and say hello. Anne, where are you, Anne? Welcome home. And spent three months in hospital um, after what was a major operation, but had some complications and different things. But she's home now, looking younger than ever. So welcome home. Okay, why don't you turn just say hello to someone nearby. away. Take your seat. Come back to your seat. That's it. Fantastic. Grab your seat. Fantastic.
Okay, just a few announcements. Not many this morning. Just to remember that uh, there's been some changes in the parking next door. Um, Wilson put the price up if you go there and swipe your credit card or your, de your debit card. It went from $7 to $10, um, which is, in my opinion, criminal. But anyway, not that my opinion counts. But if you load the Parkmate app on your phone, it's $8, okay? Yeah, I think it's $2 saving, uh, gives you 12 hours for $8, so uh, make use of that. Um, also, you know, parking can be tricky. They do monitor next door, so make sure you do do it properly because there's there used to be a $65 fine if you park there and you don't have the, the right paperwork or you're not registered there. So just be careful. Vegetables out in the back, some food out in the back, take it, use it for yourself, for anyone else. Feel free to distribute, give it away. It's important that we bless people. Now, we've got a good story this morning. May Ann, come, share a good story. You've got a, God's at work. Morning, church. You're surprised, right? Me too. <laughs> but anyway, um, just a short um, uh, story and a thanksgiving to God. Because I've been having, <laughs> stop that, James. <laughs> I've been having um, headache like every day. Like it doesn't go away even if I take um, painkiller. And um, the GP act, um, requested for um, urgent CT scan and it was okay. So yeah, and um, two Sundays ago, I <coughs> asked Pastor Mark to pray for me, over me, and just, Immediately, immediately, it's gone. I was like, <laughs> I was like laughing at him. I was like, I was crazy. It's gone. <laughs> it's gone. I was like, and he kept like asking during the week, during the, it's gone forever. Like, I don't have to take, um, <laughs> all glory to God. And yeah, um, waiting for more from God. Thank you. All glory to God. I can't, I can't dance because Gwen is here. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, that was Easter Sunday. Jesus is alive. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And uh, if you doubt or question healing, have a chat with May Ann. And uh, I don't think she has to be convinced. Um, but uh, it's funny, what does the scripture say? You don't receive because you don't ask. And that's often the way, isn't it? We don't ask. And uh, it was so, it was just, it caught us all by surprise, didn't it? And she said, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. It's like, okay. But we're talking months of headaches too. This is not just a week or d days. And God is good. Amen? Amen? So don't be afraid to ask. Always make sure you do. We're going to take up our offering. And uh, Adrian's going to lead us around communion table today. And then, of course, we have Pastor Russick as our speaker. We're looking forward to that. Why don't we pray? And uh, as we pray over the offering, Father... We thank you that, Lord, the psalmist says that everything, every breath comes from you. And I, no matter what, you know, where can I go from your presence? Lord, whether I'm in, you know, the highest place or the lowest place, the brightest place or the darkest place, you're there. And we thank you for that. Lord, I pray as we take up this offering, as, as, as people face the, the realities of finance and their world, etc., Lord, that we'll see miracles in, that, in those areas for people. For those, Lord, that might be struggling even now, Father, I pray for that abundance. I pray for that breakthrough. Lord, help us to hear you in, even in, in finance and the different things that go on. And so, Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we are blessed to be a blessing. That's the call, and we acknowledge that. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Great. Thank you. Those receiving the offering who come, that'd be great. Thank you.
Every heart that is broken, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise to you only. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to the living God. Please be seated. May I ask the steward to please serve the bread and the juice now. My uh, communion message this morning is about Jesus, the Son of Man. In the New Testament, we read that Jesus is known by a variety of names and titles. We see words like Messiah, Lamb of God, <coughs> Son of God, Redeemer, Savior, Bread of Life. <coughs> but the one that Jesus himself used most often was Son of Man, as it appears within the four Gospels including the Acts of the Apostle and the Book of Revelation. Matthew 16, 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, 
he asked his disciples, who do, you peop who do people say the son of man is? In Mark 8.31, he then began to teach them that the son of man must suffer many things. Luke 5.24, but I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sin. John 3.13, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. In all these texts, Jesus is the speaker and no one ever addresses him as son of man. He often called himself the son of man as part of his interaction with people. Where does Jesus get the term son of man? And what is the implication is of his internal textual reference? In uh, Ezekiel uh, 3, 1 to 4, God called his, him, him son of man repeatedly. And he said to me, son of man, eat what is before you. Then he said to me, son of man, eat this scroll I am giving you. He then said to me, son of man, Go now to the people of Israel and speak my words to them. In the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel is addressed by God as a son of man. God was simply calling Ezekiel as human being. He is a prophet, but he's also a man. In the Old Testament, the meaning of son of man is simply a man is a human being, and he is not God. Why did Jesus call himself the Son of Man? The origin of the Son of Man is, comes from the background of Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. In my vision at night, I look at there before me, was one like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancients of the days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom in, in one that will never destroy it. So this verse is a reference to a prophecy of Daniel that the Messiah would become the son of man. If you read Daniel chapter 7, you will see that the son of man is a very exalted figure. Not just a man figure, but an exalted figure. It was Jesus' favorite self-designation. So the word son of man being understood as title for the Messiah because it refers to the everlasting throne. His throne would be eternal. He is all-powerful, all-knowing, and creator of the universe. Daniel introduced the name Son of Man and that he was referring to Jesus as Messiah, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In other words, Jesus is both divine and fully human. Two natures in one person. In Mark 13, verse 26, Jesus said, At that time people will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. So when Jesus spoke of the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, he references Daniel chapter 7. In Mark 14, verse 62, after Jesus' arrest, he is interrogated by the high priest in response to a question to, of his identity, are you the Messiah? the son of the blessed one. Jesus again references Daniel chapter 7. He speaks of the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven 
as an event fulfilling what Daniel has said. So the title Son of Man in the New Testament is best understood as a messianic reference from the backdrop of Daniel chapter 7. In the New Testament, when the word Son of Man mentioned, there was an additional meaning. What is the additional meaning? Additional meaning is Jesus was the Son of Man, but also a fully God because He is eternal and part of Godhead, the Trinity. So why did Jesus have to come to be the Son of Man? Matthew 20, verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's amazing to think that Jesus come to be the Son of Man to give his life as a ransom for many. And to suffer death on the cross for the payment of our sin so that, so that we can be forgiven. If Jesus does not become the Son of Man, how can he die on the cross? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. So the only way we can be forgiven of our sin is if Jesus dies in our place. But Jesus can never die according to his divine nature. That's why Jesus had to take on a human being to die on the cross for our salvation so that we can have everlasting life. Amen? Let's all stand as we partake together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent your son Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior into this world. Thank you, Lord, that he died for our sins and paid for them and rose again from the dead. Thank you, Lord, that we have life and forgiveness in him. Now let's eat the bread and drink the cup together. worship. And let's just reflect on the words um, that we heard from communion. And let's also um, just keep God's presence in the forefront of our minds. That this is a time to worship Him, to glorify His name. Why don't we wait on the Lord? Let's seek His presence.
love a man. And I think it relates to a man. It's like this picture of a, a, a man who's standing and it's like he's got this uh, constricting, almost like giant rubber band around him. It's a weird picture, but anyway, bear with me. This giant rubber band around him and it's constricting, it's pulling, it is tight and it's like you can hardly breathe. And people are looking at you and saying, oh, that, this poor person, look what's happening in their life, look what's going on, there's all these things. But the picture is that I see it all of a sudden. It's like we see it from behind. And this, this binding that is wrapped around this person is being pulled tighter and tighter. And what people are not seeing is that his hand is actually holding the end of the, of the, the rubber band, if you like, and is pulling hard at this. And I believe what I'm seeing is, and this is what I, I've said to the Holy Spirit, like, what do I do with this? This is like crazy stuff. Your whole life has been one of expectation, one of putting demands on people, one of laying down um, your, your standards on people. And you think that it, you can change the world based on what you think, but basically all you're doing is you're constricting your own walk with Jesus. You're actually setting yourself apart and you're actually pulling tighter and tighter and tighter and the Lord wants to set you free this morning. And it's a real simple message. Let go of it. Let go of the expectations. Let go of the demands on people. Let go on your, your, your crazy standards that you set for others. And yet you don't live yourself. And the Lord's saying, let go of all of that and it'll, be, it'll go. But you are the one that actually holds the tension around you. And I believe it's a man. it's time to let go you talk of knowing what grace is but you won't apply it you want it you expect it but you won't give it and the Lord's saying it's going to start this way let go release stop doing these things be gracious be kind let people screw up let people fail let people not meet your standards let humility be your earmark, not these standards that are just inhuman and unreasonable because you're the one that's suffering, not anyone else. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, whoever that be in this, in this place here today, Lord, that they will let go and see that binding, that giant rubber band just spring off of them as they let go because its tension is not held by the band itself but by the pulling and the holding of that. In Jesus' name. Let freedom come to them. Lord, let them breathe a, a sigh of relief. Lord, and, and just to re recognize that what, what has been going on for such a long time is of no value to you and no value to them. Lord, let your grace and your mercy and your presence be poured out on that person right now. Let them know that you love them. Lord, let you, the, them know that you are the, the, their Lord and their Savior. And Father, in Jesus' name. Grant them freedom. It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Don't get entangled again in the yoke of bondage, says Galatians 5. It's time to let go. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, we pray for that brother that he would let go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 There's a lesson there for all of us too, isn't there? in that but I believe it's someone and at the end of the service I'm not going to ask for hands or anything like that if you want some prayer over that just come talk to me and we'll, we'll have some prayer and don't be afraid don't be worried about it sometimes it just takes a little bit of courage to step up and allow the spirit of God to make a change in you amen amen thank you amen God bless you have a seat thank you thanks team it's uh a real pleasure to introduce Pastor Russick, friend and mentor, and uh, in Australian terms we call him a good mate, and uh, he's a good mate. He checks on me, follows up uh, how I'm going, as many of you do, which I appreciate. Um, but also he's a real man of God, a man who's faithful to his, his, uh, his calling. Uh, he loves the church, he loves Jesus, and he ministers in many different places, in many different denominations. He's very much part of us, so why don't we welcome again this morning. <laughs> In that name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor <coughs> uh, Mark, for your very warm welcome. And it's lovely to be here with you. I feel so much at home. As you know, I have a very long history with this church. And it's a very special place in my heart. So here we are again in God's house. What better place can we be on a Sunday than to be with God's people in God's house? Amen. Well, my message today, uh, I've been working on this myself uh, for quite a long time. And I want to speak to you today about drawing closer to God. Through the Psalms, how do you get close to God and how we can use the help of the Psalms in order to get close to God? The book of James says, draw close to me and I will draw close to you. Now, we understand, you know, uh, <coughs> geographical distance. Johnsonville is about... 12 kilometers from here where I live, okay. Palmerston North is about 100 kilometers or something. And of course, Australia is thousands of kilometers away. We understand geographical di uh, distances. But there's also relational distances. Two people can be in the same house a couple of feet away from each other and can be 100 miles away apart relationally. Can anybody say amen to that? So what sin has done, sin, we tend to think of sin only in legal terms. That's important. It's a breaking of God's laws and there's a punishment because God, and God is a righteous God. But you see, there's another side to sin. Sin greatly affects our relationship, both to God and to to ourselves. So, you know, Ephesians says to the Gentiles, once you were far off, but you've been draw made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ, we br brought near to God. That was an establishment of a relationship. But we understand relationships, human relationships. And God's a person too. It's an interpersonal relationship. So it's a beginning, but how can we draw closer to God as we progress in life. That's why I want to address. And you see, God is interested in uh, one of the great things about uh, relationship is expressed through communication. And communication is a two-way street. How do you communicate with somebody that you can't see, but you love, as the book of Peter tells us? All right? So the Psalms I have found and, you know, not that I've arrived, but I have found tremendous help through the Psalms. Uh, uh, at breakfast time, at breakfast time, I, uh, I have wheat picks. As an alternative, I have porridge. But wheat picks, you know, I, I cut this out of the wheat, wheat picks. Wheat picks uh, is, is, is low in saturated fat, uh, fat, reduces cholesterol, and then in a little corner there, it's got five stars. That five stars is a health rating. If you get one out of five, it's not so good. If you get five out of five, well, it's pretty good. Well, if you want a spiritual, mental, emotional, and physical health rating, I would give 10 out of 10 for the Psalms. The Psalms are good for this. The Psalms are good for this. Hallelujah. All right. So that's the way I'm going, I'm going to approach this, how the Psalms helps us. Did you know, uh, by the way, the word Psalms, the Psalms, it comes from the, uh, the Greek. It means a poem to be sung to a stringed instrument. There's another word that uh, we don't use it in our circles, more in the denomination, in, in the historic churches, is the word psalter, which means a harp or a stringed instrument. But the Hebrews, they call the book of Psalms uh, uh, by the word tehillim, which means praises. 
and another word means prayer. So to them, it's a book of praises and of prayer. So let's now, um, <coughs> the psalm expresses every human emotion that we'll go through. We're going to approach that in a moment. Every human emotion uh, is, uh, is expressed in the psalms. All right. The psalms is the most Mo the, the, uh, the Old Testament book that is most quoted in the New Testament. Did you know that? It's the most often. Jesus quoted it at least almost a dozen times. And the Psalms, of course, spoke of the Messiah as well. So s I commend the book of Psalms to you. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give to you some keys that I'm discovering. Long way from, <laughs> from you know, having arrived. That's a long way away. But these are some of the things that I've discovered in my life. The Psalms is about experience. It's possible to know a truth in our minds. It's another thing to have experienced that truth. So the psalm speaks a lot about experience. All right. And so let's, so I'm going to give to you some steps today, some keys. They are not necessarily all in order, but there are some keys that I have discovered that has been a big help to me. I asked myself this question one time, and I put it to you as well. Rusik, if you were asked to declare publicly what your spiritual life is with God, your prayer life, is with God, would you be embarrassed or would you say it's reasonable? What would be the answer to that? I took up that challenge. I said, Lord, I want to be authentic in my relationship with you. It's not something that I start off and then it, it sort of goes into the background and then I restart again. And I would say generally, generally speaking, particularly in Western countries, this life, our private life of prayer and with God is one of the weakest areas in our life. In Western countries. If you went to Korea, it wouldn't be like that. Some of the other countries do. I've only mentioned one. So what I'm asking you, brothers and sisters, is... You know, what is our inner life with God like? And how can we develop that so that we draw closer to God? So that's the, that's the way I'm approaching the Psalms. All right, here's the first key. The first key, the Psalms are God's words to us. Yes, expressed through people, but God has allowed this to be put into to, to the Bible, the Word of God. And so when we approach the Psalms, we are Bible-believing people, but all the more recognize this is God's Word. And God's Word is what generates faith in our life. And by faith, we draw near to God. So isn't it amazing that Psalm 1, what's Psalm 1 about? Essentially, it says it's about a person who meditates in his Word day and night. And if we learn to meditate in God's Word frequently, uh, which is not just speed reading, which means chewing it over, chew the Word of God just like a, a cow that you know, takes in the grass and then lies in a field and chews it over. If we do that, what a tremendous blessing. You know, it tells us, and whatever they do will prosper. Now, when I go to a bookshop and I, I'm a, a bookworm, I go to the self-development uh, uh, section of the book, the book there, you know, different, they, uh, I'm interested to see what keys they say is the key to prosperity. I don't think I've ever tipped over a book where it says, you know, the Word of God is a key to prosperity. Here it is. And whatsoever they do will prosper. Hallelujah. And what kind of person you'd grow up to be? You'd be like a tree planted by the waters. It'd be an evergreen. It won't be a stunted shrub. It'll be an evergreen. 
And what's more, this tree will do two things. This tree will be, full, will be fruitful. And I like Psalm 92 that says something similar. As you're advancing in years like I am, you still be fruitful in your advanced years. How many want to be fruitful all through their lives? Lift your hand up. Respond to me. And not only will you be fruitful, you, your leaves, will never t turn brown. <laughs> all right? And you know what happens after, when it becomes really dry, it becomes crunchy, crackles, and so forth like that. No, you'll be an evergreen. So what does that mean spiritually? It means to say there will always be freshness in your life. And as I look back over you know, 50 years of ministry, and I've seen people who when they first came to the Lord, they were so excited about the things of God. And then they plateaued. And then some of them just completely fell away. And others who just go to the church, go through the motions, but where's the life? Where's the excitement? Where's the joy? That's never meant to desert us. Can you say they're meant to that? The longer we've known the Lord, the more we should be excited about God. Because you see, this is a book written by hum humans, human agents, but the divine author is the Spirit of God. And the Spirit of God has a way of quickening things, enlivening it, generating life through the Word. So that's why Psalm 1, uh, we'll go through this quickly, uh, Psalm 19, again, speaks about the Word of God, what it does for us. And did you know that the longest psalm in the Bible, in the book of Psalms, Psalm 119, has got 176 verses, and what's it all about? It's all about the psalmist engaging with the Word of God. So, so when you read the psalms, so, so, the, so, so this is what, I, what I'm doing at the present time. This is just uh, how I'm engage, engaging with it. To, to, uh, I engage with the Psalms. I re, as I get before God, one of the things I do is, uh, in the Word of God, I, I go through, through, maybe pick up a Psalm there, and I would go through that, and oftentimes I'll find, ah, I can identify with that, and I will take that, and in my words, or even use the same words to express it to God. The Psalms were written, half of the Psalms almost were written by David and the others by some unknown authors. We don't know all the events. But, you know, the, you, so the people might say, well, they lived th thousands of years ago. We're in the 21st century. Well, human nature has not changed. The circumstances might be different. David's circumstances might be different from our circumstances, but a, a human nature has not changed. We respond to the way they responded. And that's why it's so relevant for us today. All right. So I'm emphasizing the Word of God because it's, you know, God's Word is authoritative. We are to uh, respond and obey God. Simply reading is not enough. If you want to translate what is simply theoretical into what is experiential, you know what the bridge is? The bridge is obedience. Only obedience takes what is theoretical, abstract, and makes it personal and experiential. So if we want to experience more of God, you got to obey God. Because through obedience, what is at a theoretical level, at this level, reaches the heart. Okay, so the first key is, you know... The, the, the Psalms are God's Word. It's not an optional thing. It's not something take it or leave it. It's not simply good suggestion. It's not just a recommended practice. It's God's Word, and God has allowed this to be written over a period of hundreds of years, and it's been collated so it can be a great blessing to every single one of us, whatever stage of the journey we're at. Okay, so the first key is it's treated as God's Word. All right, 
number t- the second key, the second key is addressing God. Let's learn from the psalmist how he addresses God. Okay, so turn your Bibles with me, and, and, I'll, and I'll, give, I'll give you some, some illustrations of this. Okay, uh, how does the psalmist address God? Turn with me to Psalm 18. Psalm 18. Uh, okay. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, and my rock, my shield, the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. The first thing I want you to notice is it's how he uses the word my. It's personal. I know him in this particular way. The Lord is my strength. What does he mean? What did the psalmist mean by that? The psalmist meant, uh, uh, the psalmist meant that he draws his strength from the Lord. Hallelujah. This is the place where God recharges our batteries. Like our phones, are, right? It gets used up, you've got to recharge it. The relationship has to be maintained and developed. Otherwise, they go the other way. They become more distant, right? The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my rock. What does the word rock stand for? The Hebrews used to use, you know, concrete words, picture words more than abstract words. The rock, again, speaks to a place of stability and of strength. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my deliverer. The Lord is my refuge. He's my hiding place. The Lord is my salvation. All right, turn with me also to Psalm 27. I'll just give you a couple of illustrations and then move on. Because when he uses these words, it means this, that he has experienced God in this kind of situation. This psalm will probably make it a bit clearer for us as well. Psalm 27. 27, the Lord is my light. Has anybody ever again gone through an experience that's like going through a tunnel, dark? Would you lift your hand up if you've ever experienced that? Uh, all right. Okay. So when you go through a time where it appears as if dark, you can't see your way, how are you going to find your, find your way through? It's knowing the Lord as our light. Amen? The Lord is as my light. Remember in John chapter 9 where they brought a blind man to him? What was he looking for? He was looking for the ability to see physically. But we not only need the ability to see physically, we need the ability to see spiritually as well. So you know what the Lord did? Before he did anything to the blind man's eyes, this is what he said. I am the light of the world. And you know what happened? Why did, why did the Lord say that? And why did he say before the grave of, of Lazarus, before he, he raised, raised him from the dead, what did the Lord first say? I am the resurrection and the life. Why did he do that? Because the revelation of God the specific revelation of God in a particular situation matches the very need that is to be met. So when the, uh, they brought a blind man, the Lord didn't say, I'm the resurrection. The Lord said, I am the light of the world. Why? Because the need was for light. But when it came to, to the tomb of Lazarus, the Lord didn't say, I'm the light of the world. The Lord said, I am the resurrection and the life. Why? Because the need was for dead men to be raised up again. So he said, I am the resurrection and the life. So what I'm saying is, whatever our need is, there is a corresponding name of God. Hallelujah. The Lord is my light. And what else does he say? The Lord is my salvation. What's a, salvation is a very large word. One of the meanings is he's a deliverer. He sets us free from, from different things. So salvation, all right, the Lord is the stronghold. David knew the experience where he was running away from Saul, who was after his life. 
and he had to go for his life. But we were in a real place of security that God will be my protector and my shield. Are you with me? He's our protector and our shield. So, so he says this, uh, the Lord, uh, uh, and then he says, uh, and because of that, look at what kind of emotion he would experience. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? What else does he say? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who fell, stumbled and fell. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break against me, even then I'll be confident. Why? Because one thing I ask of the Lord, and that's what I'll seek after, to dwell in the house of God. Dwelling in the house of God is a place of drawing near to God. Hallelujah. So that's the way we get to know God as, as the light, as life, as a shield, as a stronghold. Uh, all those different things comes by, no, you know, God allows us to go through experience. And then as we draw near to God and draw strength from him, we experience God in that kind of revelation. All right. So addressing God is, becomes very important. It's not just mere words. And that's why, and I feel this is a part we pass over too quickly. One other revelation I should give before I go, go any further. You know, the revelation is progressive. In the New Testament, what's the first word of the Lord's Prayer? Our Father. Because Jesus came with the revelation that was not fully revealed in the Old Testament. Why? Because the Son had not come. And the only one who was in the bosom of the Father, that's an expression of very close relationship, only he could reveal him. And when the disciples asked him, says, teach us to pray, the first words he taught them was, our Father. How did he become a father? He's not the father of every human being, only in the sense that, that he originated them. He is the father only of those that have received Jesus Christ as the Savior. As many, he came to his own, his own didn't receive him. As many as received him, to them he gave the authority to become the children of God. He gave us that right. So I'm learning to, when I, uh, to, in approaching God uh, in a uh, time of private prayer and so forth, think about who God has revealed himself to be. He's a father. We're not approaching somebody, you know, who's distant. We're approaching father. And, you, you know, you know, fathers, fathers love their children. One of the things that every father, uh, every father, he wants to protect their children. He wants the very best for their children. Where, where did the idea of fatherhood start in the first place? Ephesians chapter 3 verse 14 tells us, all fatherhood sprang from God who has revealed himself as a father God through Jesus Christ. That's where it came from. So I as a father, as I look upon my children, my grandchildren, I don't want anything from them so much. It's what can I do for them? How can I protect them? <laughs> How we have the best, their best interest at heart. Of course, we love the fellowship. But it's what you can give them. It's not what, you know, uh, what they can just, uh, you can get from them. No. He's our Father. Amen. So addressing God is very important. So take time over it. Don't rush over it. Spend time. Whose presence are you approaching? We're approaching the presence of the living God. And aren't you amazed that you got 24-7 access to him? Hallelujah. You haven't got that with a prime minister <laughs> or anybody else. That he's given to us access to him through Jesus Christ to himself. We are approaching a person. God is a person. Relate to him as a person. He knows what we're going through. He feels it. Sometimes we don't feel adequate enough to be able to express it. 
Well, he understands, even if it's a broken language that we're speaking in, he understands the language not only which is spoken, but what is here, which is not properly formulated. Are you with me? Hallelujah. You see, Christianity is not an idea. Christianity is about a person. As a matter of fact, God is three persons in one. A person, how would you uh, uh, describe a person? A person is a thinking one, a one who thinks, one who feels, one who chooses, one who relates with others. That's what makes a person. So when we're approaching this God who we can't see, but we're approaching him through Jesus Christ, he thinks about us. He feels for us. He wants us to choose the right things. Spend time in thinking about God. Why? Because faith is how we draw the blessings of the Lord. Every blessing comes to us by, by faith, but faith is, has to be hooked onto something. Faith is like a lifeline. What is that hooked onto? You know what's meant to be hooked onto? God. And His Word. That's the object of our faith. It's God, His Word, and what He's done. Hallelujah. He's hooked on to this. Faith needs something to be hooked on to. It's hooked on to God. And faith draws us near to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay, so addressing God. Okay, I'll, I'll say one thing and then I need to pass on. I've got my timekeeper in front of me. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay, just turn your Bibles with me to Second Chronicles 20. And I'll il illustrate this. Uh, Second Chronicles 20. Just fine. If you can find that. Second. All right. It's basic, uh, basically uh, a vast army is arrayed against Israel. And Jehoshaphat was a good king. So what, is, what does he do? He, he draw, gets the people together, everybody together, and then he prays. Now, what I want you to particularly mark is, is verse 1, uh, sorry, uh, verse 5 on to verse 9. Verse 5 on to verse, uh, verse 9. Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hands. And no one can withstand you. Our God did not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people and give it forever to the descendants of Israel. They have lived in and have built a sanctuary for your name, saying, If calamity comes upon us, whether sword or judgment or plague, we will stand in your presence before the temple which bears your name and will cry out to you in distress. What kind of a God they were approaching, what he had done for them in the past. That was to draw faith into God. And of course, they had a mighty victory. Uh, 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 in the, Isra the Israelites had a tremendous victory. All right. Now let's go to the third one. Probably this is as far as we'll go today. Uh, so another time we'll carry on from here. Number th the third one is the Psalms. Uh, the Psalms expresses every virtue, every range of human emotions. The positive side as well as the negative side. Every range of human uh, 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 emotions. And you can f find this out for yourself. Please just don't Google it and get the answers that way. Explore the Psalms for yourself. I've given you some of the names whereby, which are revealed in the Psalms. Do your own study. You don't have to do it all in one go. Find out what else the Lord says, uh, how he's revealed his temp himself to you. Find out. Do, do some homework for yourselves. So when you go through the Psalms, s find, see what emotions are being expressed by the psalmist as you go through this. You know, Calvin, <coughs> Calvin says, this book I am inclined to style, he's talking about the Psalms, an anatomy of all, <coughs> all the parts of the soul. <laughs> that's, what, that's what he said. Uh, uh, and he goes on to say, uh, uh, so say, for no one will discover in himself a single feeling whereof the image is not reflected in this mirror. Absolutely find it true. You'll find every emotion is expressed through the Psalms 
Okay, let me give to you some of the ones. I'll start off with the negative ones first and the positive ones. Here's someone because this, probably this is as far as we'll be able to go today. Number one, anguish. Anguish. What is anguish? It's mental stress. Okay, let me give you an example of, the, uh, of this, okay? Turn your Bible with me to Psalm 13. Psalm 13, and I'll show you this. Okay, Psalm, Psalm, 30, Psalm 13. <laughs> okay. How long, Lord? Lift up your hands if you ever said it, similar words to that. How long, Lord? Would you lift your hand up? If I had more hands, I'd put more hands up. All of us have cried out to God, how long? How long? And you know, as I was going through, as I'm going through the songs, I'm underlining the places how many times the psalmist says how long. Because you see, when the answer doesn't come immediately, we are tested. We go through men, uh, anguish here. I wonder why the answer's not coming. He seems to answer other people's prayers. But that person got healed. Why, am, why haven't you got this one? And you go through a conflict over here. Can anybody say an amen to that? Hallelujah. How long will you forget me forever? Has anybody said that? <laughs> Lord, you seem to be overlooking me. We may not express it verbally, but you know it's all over here. It's just about to overflow. Hallelujah. If we're going to be authentic with God, we're going to face up to these things. Now you're suppressing it. It's dealing with it God's way. Okay, how long will you hide your face from me? Now look at verse 2. This is what anguish is. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? If you like me, uh, my mind can jump in 101 different places. And sometimes you tend to th take the worst possible outcome from a situation. This imagination can so easily run wild. We've got to bring our thoughts in captivity to the obedience of Christ, but we wrestle with our thoughts. How long will the enemy triumph over me? Whatever it is that is an opposing thing to us. All right? So a anguish, anguish. Number two, frustration. Again, from that psalm, what happens? Because we feel we can't achieve a certain thing and we feel a sense of powerlessness, we feel frustration. These emotions are like a spectrum. They flow from one into another. All right? <laughs> Number three, physical suffering. Physical suffering. When we go through physical suffering. All right, turn with me to Psalm 41. Psalm 41. Psalm 41. Oh, look at verse 3. Isn't this encouraging? The Lord sustains them on their sick bed and restores them from the bed of illness. So when you go through the Psalms, oftentimes you may have a need, and when you come across a scripture that meets that need, you know that God is speaking to you through that. You haven't engineered it. No, as you, you know, reading the scriptures on a regular basis, it'll be amazing how God will pinpoint what your need is and, and express a promise through it. So here's one. And you'll find many of them like that, you know, uh, where, where, the, where the psalmist is suffering. He's crying out to God. And he prays for the Lord to quicken him, make him, uh, uh, make him good again. And you'll see that kind of uh, expression. Okay. Here's another one. All right. Please. <laughs> Uh, or I'm doing the negative part. We're going to come to the positive. We'll just see how far I go. Uh, have I reached the first milestone? I have. Okay. So, okay. Psalm 42. Psalm 42. <coughs> okay, Psalm 42. Oh, I'm looking at the, this. Yeah. Okay, we need to get back to the Psalms again. 
Just bear with me. Psalm 42. Psalm 40. When we are feeling downcast or depressed, when we're feeling downcast or depressed, you know, I've, I've, I've gone to this psalm when you're feeling low. I've gone to this psalm. Psalm 42, uh, uh, Psalm 42, you know, uh, look what he says in verse, in verse 5. He, what he's going through. He says, my soul, why, my, uh, why my soul are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? That's the first time. Look at he says it the same time in verse in verse 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 uh, six, isn't it? My soul is downcast within me. And again in verse eleven, my soul is downcast. And then 40, Psalm forty three goes goes with Psalm forty two. Notice again, my soul, uh, verse five. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why are you so disturbed within me? All right, that is his situation, but he does something about it. What does he do something about it? Well, look at the way the psalm starts. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When can I go and meet with God? God takes that experience, that negative experience that you're going through to drive you into God, to know where the source, ultimate source of help is. Have you ever gone through an experience where God has taken away the props from your life? You're depending on this one and you're depending on that one. And God at times takes the props away. Why? Because he wants you to know the ultimate source of all blessings comes from God himself. What is worship? Worship is worth-ship. The value of God increases the more you know him. And because he becomes more value to us, out of our total being comes forth worship. The singing is the expression, outward expression, very important, but it comes from that inner spring called the heart. And so you see what's happening? The Lord is drawing the psalmist closer to himself. It's like he's panting. But who's he pending for? He's pending for God. As the, as, the, as the deer pants for the streams of water, my soul pants for you, O God. My soul is thirsty for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet for him, with him? So it's not a matter of, oh, uh, all right. In the morning, you might be a morning person. I'm a morning person. You might be an evening person. Oh, it's 6 o'clock. Right. I'm going to have a time with God. Right. I can tick the box. Now, what's the next thing on my agenda? <laughs> Take this box. So, you know, coming into God's presence can be simply a matter of ticking a box. A matter of obligation. What does God want us to do? Bring us to a place. No, we really want to, go, want to meet with God. It's not to impress anybody because this is a private matter. Publicly, we come together, corporate and a personal. Why? Because God wants to meet with you one-on-one, -on -one, exclusive. And then, of course, he wants to meet with us together as God's people as well. Hallelujah. So, uh, when was people were parading the spirituality, the Lord said, go into the private place, shut the door, talk to your father in secret. Because that is the ultimate proof of our true our spirituality is your life with God. Everything springs from you. We are not fate, fit to face people until first we've faced God. Hallelujah. That's why when the apostles were del uh, the church was growing, they delegated the responsibility. Two things they didn't delegate. Prayer <laughs> and the ministry of the word. They had to face God first before they could face people. 
And it must, God has to take it from what we give a mental assent to to make it experiential. And he uses our circumstances to ta translate it from this level to that level. So where we meet with God. Okay. Okay. <coughs> all right. So, uh, uh, all right. I'll just give you one more. Fretting. 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 All right. What is fretting? Fretting is where, where something is eating away at you. <laughs> okay. Has anybody had that where something is eating away at you? Would you please lift your hand? I want to know if I'm talking to, to, to people that are like me. Something is kind of, it, it nags at you. Something which is like a, a worm at the uh, in the core of an apple, it keeps eating away there. Okay, I'm illustrating this because my time is uh, up and, uh, and then we will stop. <laughs> okay, uh, so turn with me to Psalm 73. Psalm 73, an example of this, all right? Okay. Psalm 73. So, okay, what is Psalm 73? Uh, so, uh, Psalm 73 about? Look at this. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. Look at this. Almost slipped, and I nearly lost my foothold. He's speaking spiritually. Do you know why he had lost his, or was about to lose his foothold? Because I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Sometimes you going through and you look at people who are not serving the Lord. They seem to be enjoying great health. They seem to be prospering. And then this thought can come to you. They're not serving the Lord and they're prospering. Not fair. I'm serving the Lord and I'm going through this. Has anybody experienced that? Would you please lift your arm? I'll put, put both my hands up. It's not fair. Okay. My foot had almost slipped because I saw them prospering. Uh, right. <coughs> and, and then what, ha what, what, what happened in verse 16? When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. This sense of unfairness troubled me deeply until, verse 17, I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. This one I understood. While I was comparing it in the short term, these people were prospering, but what's the long term? In the long term, you know, it's destruction. They might appear to be prospering now, but what's in the future? Because God will, you know, judge. Nobody can get away from that. You know, those that have done wrong, they'll have to pay for it unless they've asked Jesus to be the Savior. All right. So what have I taught so far? One, treat the Psalms as the Word of God. is a very healthy food for our inner life. Number two, learn to address God in the many different revelations that is given to us that fits your particular situation. Number three, and we've only taken three or four, and only the negative ones, there's positive ones to joy, victory, all that as well, okay? But what I'm saying, okay, so I've given you some examples in how the psalmist engage with it. So don't just take the verse that gives a promise, read the whole psalm, then you'll understand how the psalmist engaged with God in a particular situation. Are you with me? All right. Well, th th this will have to wait for another time for us to continue, but I didn't want to simply rush through it. It should give you some, some clues of the way I, I'm seeking. I'm not saying this is the only way, but I'm finding this is helpful, helpful for me. And you know what? what? The more you know the Psalms, the more it will increase your vocabulary in which to express your emotions. Are you like with me? With me, you know, like if if, if you uh, if you learn another language, you know there's certain things you feel, but you can't express it in that language. In your mother tongue, you can, but you can't do it in this tongue. 
But isn't it go good to know that God can increase our vocabulary that we can do both? You know, sp uh, pray to God in the Spirit. He understands that language. But also, he didn't say either or. He said both in 1 Corinthians 14, pray with understanding also. And that understanding will grow as we develop in our ability to communicate with God. Praise the Lord. All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we bless you, Lord. There's, Lord, some seven billion people on the planet Earth. And you want to have fellowship with each one of us. Amazing, Lord. Amazing. We're not a number to you. You know us by name. You said, Abraham, Abraham, Moses, Moses. Hallelujah. Mark, Mark, Russick, Russick, Christine, Christine. He calls us by name. John chapter 10. He wants to have fellowship with us. And you know, communication can be either superficial or it can be at, the, at a deep level. Before God, we bear our hearts before him. Tell him what, he f what we're feeling through. He understands it. And, you know, this is how we learn to communicate and build our relationship with him. Well, well as Father, the first thing I'm going to pray for is, Lord, make this thing alive to each one of us. Father, I pray, Lord, take these words, Lord, imperfect as they are th through an imperfect vessel, but it's your words that we've quoted, Lord, cause these words to be driven deep into the hearts of your people and as they meditate upon it open the, our minds and our hearts dear God so we can see things the way you said and why you allowed these things to be written into the Bible dear God Father now we're going to pray for needs while our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed please perhaps we could all stand could we all stand and, and maybe the musicians can come up if you have a need We'd love to pray for you. Would you please come forward, uh, you know, if you're not well in your body or you're going through some, em some emotional, you know, uh, uh, dark spot or, or something that's causing you great anxiety. So we want to pray not just only for physical uh, healing. We want to pray for emotional healing. We want to pray for m mental healing. All right, if you've got a need and you want to support today, would you please come forward? Pastor, would you help? Uh, would, uh, uh, if, you, if, if, you, if you have a need, would you please come forward? Thank you. Thank you. Don't be afraid. If you want us to, uh, to pray for you, would you please come forward? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Please don't be afraid if you have a, a need, you're not well, or there's some something that, you know, it may be a job need, it might be a financial need, it may be an emotional need. Please don't be afraid to come forward as we pray for these people. All right, the altar is open. You may be seated. And would you please come uh, if you need prayer today? Pastor, would you help? Okay. Okay, sister, would you come and stand? What would you like prayer for today?
Fantastic. Great message, yeah. Real stirring message. Should we get him back for the next part? Okay, yes, that's a vote. You, you, you can come back. So, <laughs> fantastic. So, thank you for being here. God bless you. Have a fantastic week. And go and bless someone else. Um, and go and dig yourself into the Psalms. That's your homework this week. Amen? God bless. Thank you.